Hey everybody, welcome to this week's episode of the Bottom Dollar Outdoors podcast. I'm your host Brad, and this week we've got an excellent show lined up for you today. If you grew up in the South, especially if you were born probably from the late 80s and before that, then you remember growing up and hearing the sounds of Bob White quail roosters making their calls. You may have heard them from time to time since then, and you'll be like, man, I haven't heard that sound in a long, long time. Well, there was a decline in the population, and they're kind of starting to make a resurgence. So today, we're going to find out why you're starting to hear that resurgence of Bob White quail. We're going to kind of discuss how to keep them here. Today, we're talking with Mike Hook from the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources. He is the coordinator of the small game projects there for the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources. He's also a member of a board member of the National Bob White Quail Initiative. Guys, I hope you really enjoy the show today. He's going to kind of go into, we're going to kind of dive into a bunch of things. We're going to dive into agricultural impacts. We're going to dive into some of the things that you can do on your farm to or on your property to kind of bring back those numbers and provide them some habitat. Talk a little bit about predators. We're going to talk about different associations you can get involved with. We're going to talk about how quail even interact with other wildlife on your property so guys i really hope you enjoy this interview mike was an excellent excellent source of knowledge for today's topic i personally i started hearing quail this year got me back interested in trying to figure out what happened and what we're doing to bring them back so everyone i really hope you enjoy this so here's the interview with mike hope you enjoy it stick around Michael, I, I see that you, you you went to Clemson University and University of South Carolina, moved on to DNR. What what do you do there with DNR? I am the small game program coordinator. Um, the small game program takes care of um, rabbits, squirrels, dove, quail, woodcock, uh, grouse, uh, that type of thing. We, you know, occasionally I have to answer a, a snipe call or something like that, but our our big projects are morning doves and, and Bob White quail. Um, that's sort of what gets most of our attention. But like I said, we do mess with the other species as well. Okay. That's woodcock. That's something I haven't, that's a term I haven't heard in a long time. <laughs> it's there. They're around in good numbers and they are a blast to hunt. Um, you know, I, I grew up, my granddad, bird hunted and all and you know obviously he talked about bob whites but i don't remember him ever mentioning woodcock and they just don't have the the history down south that they do up in the northeast um you know they, they've got a storied tradition up there and just they had to have been around and i'm sure folks saw them but i don't you know and i guess they took them incidentally but I, they must have not targeted them much but um yeah, I mean they're they're a lot of fun. I I do a good bit of of, of woodcock hunting when they're in season. They got a short season, um, but but they're a blast. And like I said, they're here in good numbers across the state. So if if you're within the borders of South Carolina, you're in pretty good woodcock territory. So yeah, a friend of like mine. Said, they're yeah, a lot sorry, of fun. my friend of mine. He's from up in Michigan, and he came down. He lives here now, and he lives right here, not too far from me, and. He was out there one day and he heard the noise. They made. Apparently, they make a strange noise. I don't think I've ever heard one. If I have, I didn't know what it was. And he could not believe that we had them here. <laughs> you've probably heard them. Um, if you've been sitting in the deer stand December or so, you you've likely heard them and just didn't just didn't realize it. You'd never you'd never hear it and go, "That is a woodcock." You know, it's it's just an odd little. They they call it a painting noise, but. I, I don't know how to describe it, but um, they he, do it. And like I said, yeah, he said it was a strange noise. Uh, I, like I said, I, I like you said, I probably heard one, just didn't realize what it was. So you are a quail hunter or a small game hunter yourself. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, 
you know, my first memories was dove hunting and rabbit hunting with my granddad and, you know, been doing it ever since. Uh, you know, I started my, my hunting career as a, as a bird dog myself. So much like, you know, most of us, I guess, you, running out after the dead birds in the dove field. And, you know, I, I tagged along with uh, him and his old buddies rabbit hunting. And, you know, it, here in Lexington County, I remember seeing my first deer in the 90s. So, you know, that wasn't a big thing here in the, the Midlands, you know, when I was growing up. So small game was it. Yeah, I, I know I've, he was talking about you know, being younger and hunting. I know my grandpa, he talks about it all the time. You know, when he'd get off the bus, he could go bust up several cubbies of quail. Just when he got off, and he was just like me when I started, I kind of got into rabbit hunting. I've never had a rabbit dog that would run a rabbit. They were all just uh, ways to digest dog food. But <laughs> uh, he, I would go and bust, you know, just shake bushes, go bounce around in uh, brush piles and stuff like that, bust them out, but... He said that he could go out here and find five or six coveys before dark. Oh, yeah. And yep. it just seemed to kind of be a a dying thing that just kind of went away. Like I said, I remember hearing him a lot when I was a child here on the farm. And now even my doctor, I was talking to him the other day, and he said the same thing. He's like, I just don't hear him anymore. And i tell you, we get, I get that phone call a lot. Um, you know, and it's, it's very similar to yours, you know. We used to hear them here on the farm. We don't hear them anymore. You know, we'd like to have them back. And everybody I mean, of a certain age remembers that that Bob White call. And, you know, a lot of folks just sort of identify it in summer and childhood. And, you know, they, they can, you know, get pretty nostalgic about that Bob White call. But I don't know that the today's youth has that strong connection with it, but. But yeah, it certainly was a part of the landscape, you know, even even in the eighties and maybe mid nineties. Yeah, that's that was about the time I was growing up was the early nineties. Um a matter of fact, this year I seen a I seen a cubby run across the road and I was like, that was like a, a bunch of quail. Well the next <laughs> the next day uh I had one here in the field before uh, they kinda of started re maintaining it and I had one all summer long. He stayed right here in this field, even though I worked third shift. I, I enjoyed hearing him. You know, he'd wake me up every day. <laughs> right. That's cool. That's cool. And, uh, uh, yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was just saying, you know, that's sort of where they hang out is that brushy, weedy, messy, nasty stuff. And that, you know, that's what's missing from South Carolina now is, is that habitat. And, and when it disappeared, they disappeared. So, Can you, What kind of habits do they have? Um, like, how big is usually a covey? What do they like to eat in their preferred habitat? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, they, just in general, they like, they're, they're, well, they're an early successional species, meaning, you know, they like that early brush scrub, grassland type habitat. Um, you know, a lot of folks picture them down in South Georgia with the big old pine trees and all the grass underneath. And that's, you know, that's sort of it. But, you know, they're, they're a ground nesting bird. They don't need those pine trees. You know, they're they're more interested in that that shrub co- cover layer, um, and that's you know that's what they need. And you know, my granddad grew up in Saluda County, and they didn't have the the tower and pines. They had farmland, you know, and in farmland, that scrub shrub habitat just comes in the form of you know hedgerows and and ditch banks and all that good stuff and and back in the day you know they didn't they didn't have the mechanization we've got today and 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 didn't keep a farm as clean as 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 folks do now and and so all that would just grow up and it it just incidentally created good bird habitat um but but you know ideally uh they need those native warm season grasses for nesting um, that broom straw, the Indian grass, uh, blue stem, that type of grass, just a bunch of grass. Um, they need a bunch of weedy species, just broadleaf weeds, ragweed, partridge pea, uh, beggar lice, um, that type of stuff. And that's that's their brood cover. That's where they're taking their chicks to, to go bug. And, and they get seeds from the, the wildflowers and all, too. And then they just need escape cover, which is that hard, woody cover where, 
they can run to if you know if a hawk gets after them or you know bobcat or fox or whatever um you know they they need that that escape cover that they can get into but but if if you look at the whole overgrown field and go man somebody needs to get out of bush hog it's likely good bobwhite habitat that um, means my pasture right now is perfect habitat <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's covered it's so thick in there you can't even really walk through it i've let the bush hog and kind of go away since we got rid of our cattle yeah. since, since we're on the topic of agriculture and farming uh what as far as what farmers do on their property what what is the main cause what can what is the causes of the quail leaving is it the bush hog and ex, or post the stuff they put down sprays is it what what's the kind of things that they do that kind of hurts the numbers it's a little bit of everything honestly um you know back in the day we had a ton more farm farmland in South Carolina than we've got now. And and when a lot of those farmers just packed up and left, they either let it grow up or they planted pine trees. Um, and, and so that takes away a good bit of the habitat. Um, like I say, you know, the quail, they, they don't live in that heavy forested area. And so that just sort of squeezes them out. Um, when they were, were a lot of farms, they were actually smaller farms. Um, our farm sizes today are just huge. Well, what the small farms did was created a lot of edge. You know, everybody had their property line. There's likely a fence or what have you. And those areas would grow up and it would create just little postage stamps all across the state. That's perfect bobwhite habitat. You know, a, a mega farm today, you're talking big squared up fields and a bobwhite's only going to use the first hundred or so yards of one of those large fields and then the rest is just a desert to him so you know you got that and then you combine that with how clean agriculture's gotten um you know just from the machinery itself combines today they do not leave a scrap on the ground you know when it comes to to excess seed and all years ago it was leaving a bunch of corn or whatever it, you were harvesting. I mean, a good bit got scattered. Um, that helps. And then you go to start thinking about what you were touching on a minute ago with, with the herbicides and all. We didn't have herbicides decades ago. Um, folks would manage their weeds and all a little bit differently. Um, I mean, you look at a cornfield today. There is nothing underneath that corn for a, a quail to make a living in. You know, there there is no weeds, there is no seeds. You know, there's no bugs under there. It's just bare. I mean, growing up, I used to rabbit hunt in cotton fields, and there's just all kind of weeds and junk in a in a cotton field back in those days. But you look at a cotton field today, but it's 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 slick underneath the cotton, and you know, it's just it's just a lot of little factors here and there, and you know, mechanization on on farm implements has even changed some things too. You know, everybody used to not have a bush hog. Um, they would routinely burn. They'd let fallow fields go for a year. I mean, that was just sort of their practice. That you know, they would instead of fertilizing, they would they would fallow a field, switch to another field, and then come back the following year, and they would rotate it like that. Well, that's that's quail habitat. Um, you know, it's it just, it wasn't one thing, it was just a lot of things. And you could make the same arguments about, um, you know, industrial timber and timberland in general. Um, the way they used to manage timber just created quail habitat. You know, they were, they were grubbing and pushing up log decks and, you know, their site prep, <laughs> they were pushing it up into piles and burning it. Well, that's, that's quail habitat, you know. Nowadays, it's a it's a chemical site prep, and you know you sort of sterilize the ground for for a year or two, and and let those seedlings get up and going. You know, it's just they were creating quail habitat by accident, just the way they farmed and and grew trees, and you know that's just not happening these days. We gotta we actually have to work to make that mess that we used to just do it by accident, but. 
Yeah. With the, um, I know right here, here close by, they just done a bunch of clear cutting. Now, after they first cut the trees and, you know, get all that underbrush and stuff growing like that, is that decent habitat for them there until they come back and... Um, it is. It is. Um, you know, it it's really pretty decent quail habitat up until maybe seven or eight years in. Um, when those pine trees start getting up to a, a height where they're shading out the, the ground cover, um, you know, it's it's really pretty decent quail habitat and you know that a bunch of the wma land across the state is is owned by timber companies and you know it's just little unnamed wma pockets here and there but folks can go and find birds on those properties once they clear cut them um it's just you know it's just real ephemeral habitat i mean you know it's only gonna last a couple years but but if you you keep track of that type of stuff, you can you can find some decent hunting on them. So yeah, you know it's 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 like I say it's pretty decent habitat up to about seven or eight ten years. Then it goes away, and then when you start thinning, you know fifteen seventeen years in, it starts coming back. And then when you do your second thin, you're really starting to get into some good bird habitat then. So. Oh, yeah, you that's... know, over the life of a stand, it it provides some good habitat. There's just that in between stage where, you know, you're sort of out of the bird business for 15 years or so. Yeah, whenever it starts, they get that when they thin it out and it's got that nice, pretty undergrowth grass and stuff. Nah, that's right. See through it. Oh yeah, nah, that's right. Yeah, and and you know, we we planted several million acres in the 90s, um, just statewide. They, I mean, there was a bunch of loblolly planted in the mid nineties and just as timber cycles have, have cycled through, we're just now getting to where a lot of folks are cutting those. Um, you know, a, a lot of folks don't, don't take care of their timber probably like they should. They don't do the thinning and all. They just do a, a, a clear cut, wait 20 years, clear cut it, you know, and start over. But, um, we're, we're getting to that point where a lot of that timbers, um, being cut these days, and I think that's where a lot of our uptake in quail is coming from. Just, just folks' natural, you know, timber harvest schedule coming due. You know, after all those <laughs> millions of acres of pines being planted in the '90s. So, hopefully, we'll see that continue for the next couple of years. Is that you mentioned? You know, you got your, you know, you're talking about how big farms are now. Uh, I know down in low state, I see that when I go down towards Santee and places like that, the big sod farms and big orchards and cotton fields. Up here in the upstate, it's still kind of the small farms and mini farms, like 10-acre fields and stuff. What can farmers, even uh, just across the state, what can they do to the, change their habits or the way they do things to kind of promote a little bit of quail habitat? Just think about what quail need, you know, from a, a day-to-day standpoint, you know, it, I fight this with my dad and his brothers here around the house. You know, they, they see an overgrown field and it just tears them apart to leave it like that. You know, <laughs> it takes everything they can to not get on that tractor with the bush hogs to mow it down. But, you know, if you're not going to be using those fields or field edges or, you know, everybody's got a little corner here or there that they're not doing anything with, let it grow up a couple of years, you know, say three years, then bush hog it. And, and disc it in the wintertime and then wait another three years and do it, repeat it, you know, um, just pockets here and there, there goes a long way. Um, you know, if, if you got a, a fence line, let it grow up a little bit. You know, it's not going to hurt it. Um, uh, ditch banks, you know, mow one side one year, mow one side the other year, instead of mowing them both, you know, twice a year, keeping them you know, looking like the Augusta National, you know, let them, let them get a little, little fuzzy on the edge. You know, that's, that's what those birds need. And, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't take a whole heck of a lot to, to provide bird, bird habitat. Um, but it's just, it's just that concerted effort of thinking, all right, I'm not going to mow that field. And then that's going to be my bird habitat. And, you know, if somebody wants some signs, I probably can get them a sign or two saying, that that is bird habitat, <laughs> and, and that it's okay to feel that way. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Uh, the birds live here. 
that's right. Yeah. You know, and it's, I say that half joking, but we've had to put up those signs on our WMAs and all. Um, you know, this is by design. You know, this this is a nasty, ugly area. We get it, but it's by design for for the quail. And and honestly, it's not really even just for the quail. Um, you know, they, there's a whole host of species that use those early successional habitats that are just just disappearing like the quail. It's just not quite as noticeable. Um, you know, brown-headed nuthatch, meadowlark. Um, you know, a lot of people notice the whippoorwills. You don't hear the whippoorwills like you used to. Well, they're they're using the same habitat as the bobwhite, but you know, in, in the case of like the Bachman sparrow or something, you know, it's just a little brown bird. And you know, I don't know that the average person is going. You know, I haven't seen a Bachman sparrow around here lately. You know, but they do recognize that Bob White, and they say, "Oh man, I haven't heard one in a long time." But I mean. You can look at a, a loggerhead shrike population model, and it looks just like a bobwhite. I mean, it's the decline is almost exactly the same over the last 30, 40 years. And it's just because they use the same habitat. They're using the same same messy junk that the bobwhites are using. So, you know, when, when, you're, when you're managing for bobwhites, you're managing for a lot of other species. But, um, but yeah, just in general, let things go a little bit and, I've, I've joked around with a lot of folks over the years. If I could get the farmers to trade in their bush hogs for a disc, we'd have a ton more quail than we've ever, we've got right now. And it's just, you know, just everybody got to get out and bush hog that field. So, yeah. and, 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 and the reason I say disc is, is winter disc and provides a lot of good bird habitat. Um, if you can manage those fields, the, the best thing to do is, is that winter discing. Um, discing from November to mid-February um, in those open areas, just it, it gets rid of the unwanted fescue and Bermuda and all your side-forming grasses, and it promotes the native warm season grasses and those beneficial weed species, the, the beggar lice and the ragweed and partridge pea and all. Oh yeah, I can definitely tell you we got plenty of beggar lice around here. I went to uh, mushroom foraging the other day, and I could just see the old brown ones that were still stuck to my pants leg. Yeah, so there we well, can still have got, some of that. If you got beggar lice, you've got good quail habitat. <laughs> um, I mean, if you walk through a, a, a patch of woods and you come out with beggar lice, you're you're in decent quail habitat. So, I'm glad well, did you find to some? Did you find some good mushrooms the other day? I did. I've uh, actually got, I think I've got my last batch of uh, chanterelles and uh, found a a few other things. I've got a couple of uh, big puffball mushrooms. Uh, Back in, I guess back in March or April, I found some uh, morels. So I got lucky with that. Very cool. So that's a new hobby I kind of took. It gets me out in the woods, gets me walking around instead of just sitting around waiting for deer season because I've never... (laughs) Never got a chance to do much bird hunting. There's not a lot of birds here to hunt, or and rabbits are starting to come back. But and the reason the rabbits are coming back, I was going to touch on this now. Uh, we had a lot of feral cats, right? And I was going to ask you about the invasive species. I know you got your natural predators like hawks and uh, bobcats, things like that. But what kind of damage do the invasives like the feral cats and hogs and even do armadillos even play a part in it? All of them can, for sure. Um, you know, when it comes to cats, if if they're around, they're going to wear out bobwhites. Um, you know, they're, bobwhites are a ground nesting bird. They spend all their time on the ground. I mean, they can get away from a cat, but they, they can put a hurting on them. Um, hogs will certainly eat a nest if they find it. I don't know that they're going to search out nests, but, you know, they certainly will destroy some nest and and they they'll destroy habitat too um you know that's that's probably the bigger issue with hogs is, is they're they're destroying the the bob white's habitat just as much as anything else um you know armadillos they're they're gonna do a little bit of damage um even you know a lot of folks will ask about coyotes they they'll they'll eat a quail if they come across it it's it's fairly rare but um 
one thing that's interesting is there's a pretty good correlation between coyotes and cotton rats. Um, they focus on the, the cotton rats more than the um, Bob White quail. So if you've got a healthy population of cotton rats, you'll probably protect your, your quail. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's not much that doesn't like a, a quail. It, you know, <laughs> everything is out to get them, including us. So um, they, they've got a, a tough road to hoe. So just yeah. from, from a predator standpoint. Yeah, it's kind of hard to be on the bottom of the food chain. But what is, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> I know we have a new thing that's kind of come out here. I actually did a show on it a couple of weeks ago, but these the tegu lizards, what kind of impacts will they have if they make a, get a hold on the ground here? Much like all the other species we were just talking about, uh, they they could have an impact on them for sure. You know, quail being a ground nest and birds, those lizards are going to, Munch on those eggs. Um, you know, I don't know that they can take a, a bird, but I believe they can certainly impact the, the nest for sure. Good. good. And uh, Those are some crazy lizards too. They, they are, and it's scary that they are so weather tolerant from where they come from in South America, how they can withstand the cooler weather. So they, this is a perfect habitat. It's very, very similar habitat to where they're at in, I think they're from Argentina. Right. And I didn't realize how quick they were. <laughs> yeah. Actually, they they sort of look slow, and but they are not. They got some speed to them. Yeah, I, they're like a little version of that uh, Komodo dragon, which I seen at a zoo in Atlanta, and they were feeding. Yeah. Them. No, those things are not slow, not whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> and they're strong. Yeah, that's that's just crazy. I yeah. I I hope that we don't get those established here in South Carolina and. and Actually, um, hopefully South Carolina's got a little protection now against some of that. They've just passed a new legislation package that uh, protects some of our native species and then and then puts the the brakes on some of these introduced species. So hopefully that'll that'll um, help our native reptiles and amphibians. I always make sure whenever I I find somebody said, oh, I just bought a new tegu or I bought an iguana. And I'm just like, look, when that thing gets too big or you can't handle it, make sure you find somebody can take it. Do not let that thing go in our state. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Yeah, but, uh, let's see. Where was I? We kind of went over. We kind of skipped over the order of where I was going in here, which was great. It answered all those questions first. So I, you're, what is your position with the Bob White Quail Initiative? For South Carolina, so I am the quail coordinator for the National Bob White Conservation Initiative, um, and I'm going to go into a lot of backstory here, but just bear with me. Go ahead, so, I'm listening. <laughs> in the '90s, all the Southeast biologists were going, uh, "Guys, we we've got some issue here with the Bob White, but we don't know what to do." and and my predecessor, three times removed, uh, Mr. Brett Carmichael, uh, who actually is, is working for us again now with the Bob White Initiative, but he was in my position back in 95, and he called together a meeting here at the, at, at, in South Carolina at the Web Center of, of most all of the southeastern states. And they they just sat around and asked, you know, is this something we need to be concerned about? Is this something we can work on? And it was all unanimous, yes. And so they created the Southeastern Quail Study Group. Um, it gained a fair amount of traction, started getting some national attention. Um, it eventually encompassed all 25 states of the, the natural bobwhite range. And it sort of morphed into the National Bobwhite Conservation Initiative. Because, like I say, Bob White decline is not a South Carolina problem. It's not just located here. It, we're not the only state. It's everybody in the nation that's, you know, in the Bob White range that's having this problem, and it's all the same problem. It's just that habitat's disappearing. I mean, you know, Bob White's range from Florida to, to New Jersey, over to Ohio, Nebraska, you know, all the way over to Texas and all, and it's, it's all the same issue. You know, our our problems aren't quite like New Jersey's, but it all boils down to 
their habitat just disappeared. You know, uh, Ohio is facing a little bit different habitat changes, but it's still it's just a habitat issue. So, like I say, they they come together and they say we got to do something at the national level. Form the NBCI, that National Wildlife Conservation Initiative, and and they rolled out a plan back in 2002. Um, immediately, they started working on revising the plan, and 10 years later, they come out with version 2.0, and um, it was in that version they said, all right, states, y'all have got to figure out how you want to implement this plan, and so South Carolina decided they would come up with a plan, and, and the plan's online. I can, you know, it's a 30 or 40 page little booklet, full color, and all that good stuff. And it just outlines how we're going to put, basically put that habitat on the ground here in South Carolina. Um, and we realized pretty quick watching other states that, you know, you can't do it alone. So we created a, the South Carolina Quail Council, and that's, that's a group of anybody that has got anything to do with quail and land management in South Carolina. So, you know, it's all your state, federal, local governments that do land management. Bob White, I mean, um, biology, forestry, any of that. Um, got some NGOs thrown in there, Quail Forever, um, the Turkey Federation, um, you know, and then there's a couple private individuals that's been around birds for, for forever here in South Carolina. It's also on the Quail Council. And um, from the Quail Council, they created a couple steering committees, and I am on the technical committee that I'm, I'm, you know, through my position with the DNR, where we do the nuts and bolts of the, the habitat manipulation and the research and monitoring efforts that are associated with this project. But um, there's a steering committee, a technical committee, a uh, communications committee, which is run by actually a, a private individual named Mark Coleman. Um, I don't know how we got lucky and found him, but he just reached out to us and he said, hey, this is what I can do and I can offer are y'all interested? And we said, sure, because I don't know if you know this or not, but biologists aren't real good at Facebook and, and Internet stuff. So he, he said that's what he could do. And we said, sure, absolutely. And um, so that's who runs our social media pages and all like they. Um, and then, you know, it's just it's just grown from there. And so I sort of coordinate the habitat projects here and there and across the state and, and the monitoring as well so that's in a nutshell that's it from an, its inception okay with the what are i know a lot of organizations they have like a several like just a set of like a mission statement and the four like main topics they're trying to do what are what is the quail initiative here in south carolina what are their what's their mission statement what are their like top like points they're trying to address it's habitat it, it, it's it's a one word thing. We're just trying to put habitat on the ground here in South Carolina. Um, the the NBCI goal um, is to get back to 1980s population as a starting point. Um, we've got a long way to go to get there, but but like I say, the the Bob White Initiative's biggest goal was just to put habitat on the ground. Because I, I see a trend, in, especially in agriculture in general, of kind of going back to more holistic ways of doing it without using pesticides, herbicides, things along that nature. I see that being a big benefit to all small game and wildlife in general. Is do you agree with that? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and you are, you know, this the, the farm to table aspect of farming is changing a little bit of that. You, you're seeing some of these, you know, family farms around town and all that that have recently picked up and started farming again, and, and they're just doing small scale stuff, selling to restaurants, selling to friends and family. But you know, years ago, I don't know that that would have been possible, and and that's creating some of that quail habitat and, and small game habitat again that used to be here. Um, and I, you know, I. I do want to say that all of the advancements in technology and agriculture have not been bad. Um, recently, some of the stuff that they can do with precision ag is smart farming. It's just 
unbelievable. Um, the I don't know if you've been in one of these modern tractors or not, but it's almost like sitting in the cockpit of a F-14. I mean, there's just you sure you're surrounded by computers as everything's run off GPS and you know, the inputs going through that tractor and putting the seed and fertilizer and all on the ground is just unbelievable. But what that gives them the opportunity to do is find out what their most productive portions of the field are. And, and farmers are realizing, wait a minute, I've got a piece over here that, you know, I'm putting so and so many dollars in, but I'm only getting so and so many dollars out. I may can put this fallow it and, and, and actually come out better you know using some of these cost share programs and all that good stuff but um so don't i don't want to feel like farmers feel like i'm dogging on them for using technology but but like say you know some of this stuff is really cool coming out but but yeah i mean those small farms are are going to be a benefit to two south carolina quail populations and small game populations so yeah i'm excited about it yeah, and I've seen a you know just going back to like the kind of the homesteading aspect is coming back to people now. I see a lot of people raising quail themselves. Bob White's or um, uh, there was another one I cannot remember the name of it now, but Coternix Coternix quail. As far yep. as the Bob Whites go, if somebody said they did want to kind of get some quail reestablished, could they use like pan hatched or hand hatched Bob Whites to kind of do that, or do those birds not have that instinct that they need? They just they just don't do well. Um, they if if you release them, they've got about depending on what research you look at, it's it's about one to four percent chance of making it a year. Um, they just they don't have the instinct. If they do happen to make it, they have really bad parenting instincts. Um, they're not they're not good at at raising young. Um, like I say, they just, they just make bad parents, but uh, it's not to say it's not possible, but you know, I've, I've get every now and then I'll have somebody tell me that they've done it successfully. And, you know, I say more power to you. That's awesome. You know, but I wouldn't suggest somebody to try to do that. You know, um, you know, there, there's some of these shooting preserves that do the early release and they put thousands upon thousands of birds out on the the landscape and you know they never take so you know it's just may just be sort of happenstance when it does work but but if you create the habitat wild birds will use it they'll show up and use it and and i'll tell you that's one of my favorite calls that i get is you know you'll you'll go out and do a site visit with somebody and two or three years later they'll call and say michael you will not believe what i heard today and then I heard the first Bob White I've heard in 30 years out here. <laughs> and, and, you know, they're just, they're just shocked, but it's, you know, in most areas, there's, there's at least a small population of birds hanging around somewhere close enough that when that habitat opens up, they take advantage. So, I mean, as good as quail are at dying, they're really good at reproducing too. So when that, that habitat opens up for them. They can really take advantage. They can have multiple clutches throughout the summer. They'll just have a little population boom take over, and then eventually that habitat will disappear and fade out, and so will the birds. But you know that's just that's the way they operate. So Good. you know, I, I I wouldn't place my bets on on releasing birds to be the the answer. But if you create the habitat, they more often than not you'll have somebody show up and use it i got you so it's just kind of a kind of an ebb and flow of how the land works with the birds yep that's it and there's a long time quail biologist in in georgia reggie thaxton he's kind of funny saying to me that he's always said that you know for a quail population you're always two years away from disaster and he and he's pretty much right you know on these quail properties when you're managing for them it doesn't take long for if you're doing it in the pine situation for those sweet gums to take over and all of a sudden you've lost hope and you know it's just it's just one of those things so okay. yeah i mean early succession turns into later succession pretty quickly and like i say that's when those quail start to blink out i say yeah between sweet gums and uh 
persimmon trees, man. They don't take them long to repopulate. <laughs> it does not. It does not. Well, since uh, uh what the initial started, what 2015 is what I, I read. That's right. Yeah. Well, we got started in earnest in 2015. I think the first meeting was actually December 2014. Um, and so, like I say, that was sort of an exploratory meeting. We got everybody together, said, "Hey, do you want to do this?" and it was a resounding yes, so we we got going in 2015. Okay, well, since then, since y'all have got this done, what kind of trends have you started noticing as far as population and hunter feedback through the surveys and things like that that you do when you put in all this hard work? What kind of returns are you seeing on that now? So part of the Bywide Initiative, we created four focal areas, and, and they're sort of three or four counties big. And in the center of those focal areas, we had – a piece of public land and all of them you can hunt. Um, so we manage the public, the idea being you manage the public land, show private landowners around there. Hey, if you manage for quail, they'll show up. And so um, we started in 2015. And like I said, we took properties that, that were not quail properties. I mean, they just, they just weren't. Um, so we had to do what an average landowner would do. We had to go in and thin and burn and winter disc and all that. And the birds responded. Um, you know, probably two years in, you may have picked up a bird or two here or there, a covey or two or there. Um, what what you did notice real quick was that even after the first year, those non-game bird species come back. But part of our monitoring, we listen for the month, non-game birds too. And, buddy, they come back quick. The bobwhites take a couple of extra years, but... But yeah, so in those focal areas on those properties where we were really managing, the birds really picked up um, within the last year. So we're looking at what year four and five on some of these focal areas, and it's and, you know it's just sort of exponential. You know, the first year you saw one or two extra, then you saw three or four, then it was nine, and then you know it just shot on way up this summer on our whistle counts. I'm I'm excited to see what our fall cover counts look like. Um, but, but yes, yeah, so, you know, we're seeing it for the birds. Um, statewide, we are on an upswing since 2015. Our 2015 was our lowest point for the whistle uh, count that we do in the summertime. That's when we're out listening for those males whistling. And we've got about 75, 77 routes all across the state where biologists will go out, ride six miles, stop 12 times, and listen for birds. And they've been doing these since 1978. And, you know, they had, they had gotten to their lowest point in 2015. But the last five years, they've, they've been inching back up. We've been increasing maybe 5 10% every year. So it looks good. Um, part of that's what work we've been doing. Part of it, you know, just the natural timber cycles. Part of it's more people are getting tuned in to, to this you know social media helps word of mouth i mean what you're doing here on the podcast everybody hears oh well that messy field is okay you know and if they leave just a little bit that goes a long way and i I really think that's you're starting to see a little bit more of that across the state and and the bird populations are um responding as far as hunters go yeah we're certainly seeing it um the one drawback to you know, all the social media coverage and coverage in general is some of our focal areas get hit pretty hard. Um, you know, we've got two of them, well, three of them, actually. Um, the Web Center in down in Hampton County is, is one of them. Um, Oak Leaf WMA, which is actually a Forestry Commission property uh, over in Clarendon County. And then the Carolina Sand Hills National Wildlife Refuge up in Chesterfield, Um they all have limited hunting. So the National Wildlife Refuge, you can only hunt on Fridays uh, throughout bird season. Oakley, you know, it's it's a certain number of days. It's about eight days you can hunt. Uh, the Web Center, you can hunt about eight days. Um, but the Indian Creek Focal Area there in Newberry, it's open six days a week. And, I mean, it gets pounded by folks. And, and it's not just South Carolina folks who, I mean, we routinely see people from North Carolina, Tennessee, you know, it's, it's amazing to see the, the different hunters out there. And like I said, the only thing I can think of is they've seen it on the internet somewhere and 
here they come. So, you know, that's that's one of the drawbacks. I mean, if we were to close off the hunting on the Indian Creek, boy, we could see some really fantastic gains. But with that being said, you know, I'm a public land hunter. <laughs> that's that's my bread and butter. I hunt the Indian Creek too. So it's one of those things you do you know, you don't want to do that. I so you just have to go in realizing that, that those hunters are going to impact those bird populations, and and that's okay with me. So, you know, and yeah, the hunters are certainly noticing. Um, and it's it's funny I'm seeing a, a different set of hunters as well. Um, you know, for for decades, our bird hunters were older white guys. You know, in their sixties and seventies, that was sort of our bread and butter. But recently, we're seeing a, a group it's almost like it skipped a generation um you don't see a lot of 40 and 50 year old bird hunters um what you are starting to see is some 20s mid 20s mid 30s hunters and a lot of them are first time hunters never been involved with any kind of hunting before um they get in through you know the the farm to table they say i want my own protein you know locally sourced and that's what they got into bird hunting or they get a i mean Short hairs are so popular nowadays. They'll get a short hair or a visla or something, and they go, you know what? This dog's got a lot of energy. I want to do what it's supposed to do. And they get into, you know, training or whatever, and they say, well, shoot, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start bird hunting. And then all of a sudden, they just get into it, and then they get hooked. So, you know, it's, it's sort of funny. And they're those folks' expectations is completely different than the older set of hunters I've got. You know, those older set of hunters, they remember the heyday and they remember the the seventies and all and they go, Man, it's just not what it used to be and you know, they they remember those five, six, seven covey days and, you know, so when they find a covey or two there, they're happy but they're just not ecstatic. You know, some of these younger hunters, they'll go out, tromp seven, eight, ten miles spend most of the day find a covey and you would thought they would have won the lottery, you know. Oh yeah. So it's it's funny to see the differences in the hunters, but but yeah, so it's nice to have the habitat out there and and available because folks are starting to get more into bird hunting and small game in general, I think. But but I I just noticed it a lot with with bird hunting. Good, I know uh, how our laws and things are set as far as in natural resources stuff has to go through committees and the Senate and has to be approved. So I know it's kind of a pain in the butt for everybody to kind of. <laughs> especially, for, especially for DNR to kind of get stuff done because they got to go through all the red tape there in Columbia. But have, have y'all been trying to kind of adjust some of the harvest limits or anything like that? No, not for quail, really. Um, you know, it, it's sort of a balancing act. Um, and, and, you know, the, the quail limit is 12. And I don't know that anybody is going out with a realistic expectation, on, especially on public land, that they're going to find 12 birds. You know, like I said, they'll find a covey or two, and, then you, you know, on a good day, you may you may could kill a, a bird or two on the rise and then pick up some singles. But I don't think you'll ever get close to a limit. So, you know, in most instances, if you really wanted to affect the population, we'd be talking about just shutting the season down and, and, you know, I have no interest in that at all. <laughs> no. So Your dog would be well, bored. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's just, we, we haven't really thought much about it. Um, you know, as far as, as, as quail go, you know, we, we get some questions every now and then on, on morning dove seasons and all. Um, and those, those fluctuate a little bit more. And those are certainly hunters can impact their, their populations much more so probably than than bob white hunters and bob whites so you know if, if we were going to look at something it, you may would start seeing something from the the morning dove hunt but you know i don't i don't see that even on the radar right now although nationally um the feds are starting to see a little bit of a, a decline in morning dove population at, at at a national level but um if you, when you get your license and, and you're a migratory bird hunter, please always fill out that hip data. And if they don't ask you about it, tell them, hey, I want to fill out that hip data because that goes into how 
how we figure out these the migratory bird populations. So if that's one thing that hunters want to do to help out, please do that. That's that's a big thing there. So always fill out that hip data. Oh, are you guys going to keep the, the survey, the public survey, are y'all going to keep that up through the winter? Because I know when I'm going deer hunting, uh, there's been a, a couple of times, especially when I was younger, like I said, when I'm walking through the field to go hunting, the thing that'll scare the crap out of you the most is busting up a cup of <laughs> quail in the dark. Yep. Yeah, yeah. No. And so we are, we're planning on keeping that just open year round. Um, that, that public survey is sort of a new thing. Um, technology being what it is nowadays, we, um, we developed that this, I guess it was this past winter, early spring and rolled it out. And boy, the response was just terrific for the Bob White. I last check I've, all it was a little over a thousand folks that had pinpointed either hearing or seeing seeing birds and you know that's just fantastic and we're actually putting together the report right now um so we're going to have sort of a cutoff date and i've got a assistant small game program coordinator that works with me and he's actually the one that's working on that but he's going to have a cutoff date and you know everything within that year is going to go on that report and then we'll just run it year round um, and see what we can see with the Bob White trends that way. Um, the way we monitor Bob Whites traditionally were the summer whistle counts on those 77 or so routes uh, run by a biologist. And we've got, I don't know, it started, I guess, late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, doing fall covey counts on some select WMAs. And then we do the turkey and quail brood survey. And that's, you know, sort of how we kept track of the bobwhite. So this public one gives us a wider net. And, and, you know, I feel like that we can get a little bit more varied information. You know, it's not just coming from our WMAs or, you know, what have you. It's, it's more of a statewide effort. So with a heck of a lot more folks involved in it. So. I'm excited about that report. So, yeah. And, and if you live in the upstate, uh, we got one for grouse as well. If you happen to see a grouse or hear a grouse. Um, but obviously we don't, don't have near as many people participating in that one, but no, I, I don't know if I've ever, I like said, I live kind of in the middle of the upstate closer to, uh, Lawrence County. And, uh, I don't know if I've ever seen grouse. Uh, I actually, I don't know if they were pen raised, they got loose, but I have seen some, Ring that pheasant. Uh, yeah, yeah, and you, you will you'll see them occasionally. Um, they're a shooting preserve species in South Carolina, so a lot of times they'll get put out with quail and all on the local shooting preserve. So if you got one of those around you, you know they'll they'll get loose every now and then, and and you'll see them for several months. Um, I saw I know of one that was hanging out for about a year over in Newberry. You just see him every so often, and he, he lived this long time. I don't know what happened to him, but but he was something else to see. You mentioned the uh, Turkey Federation, which that brings up a question I was I had listed here. Uh, I know that you said that kind of the the nineties were kind of the beginning of the slope in the popular, or one of the parts of the biggest slope in population of quail. But that was also the heyday of turkeys, and I know the Wild Turkey Federation had a lot to do with that. Do you see a correlation with the the populations of both of those now that's kind of evened out? Um, I don't know. Um, you know, I think some of Turkey's problems today may be just sort of that lack of habitat type stuff too. Um, you know, they, they're, they're missing some brood habitat. They're, they're missing some of that early successional habitat. Um, that food aspect, you know, obviously turkeys certainly use the trees and all more so than quail, but, you know, turkeys and deer use that quail habitat as well. So, you know, I, I could see where the recent declines in those populations may have some, some correlation with the Bob whites, but, but I don't know that there's anything specific saying, you know, turkeys came on, quail went away and and you know that's a lot of old timers will say that's what happened to the quail is the turkeys ate them but you know there, there is, <laughs> there's no truth to that but 
but you know that it's just one of those things that when turkeys came home the quail were disappearing and, and some folks say that's what happened to them but but see but it, could, but it, yeah. it most certainly is not yeah. but well, and i got another one that's kind of a this is a myth i want to see what your opinion on it is you can put it to rest or however you want to but i've heard that when it comes to ground nesting birds in general fire ants since they became so big had a big impact on them that's kind of a rumor or a myth or folk legend what's your take on that it's 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 similar instance you know fire ants got going in the mid 80s quail started going down in the mid 80s it just makes sense right but you know they can impact a nest for sure um on a hot dry day if those chicks struggle to get out the eggs when they're hatching um the fire ants will overtake them and and, and you know when it comes to fire ants that's when most of the mortality happens is is chick stage you know and it's usually happening right there when the chicks are coming out um bob whites are a precocial species that means when the um chicks are born they're they're fully formed they're ready to go they're um you know they're they're just going they're, and and the first thing they're doing they're looking for um bugs so when they come out if they're if they're healthy and can get out of that egg quickly they're gonna um they're gonna make those fire ants food more so than the the fire ants eating them so long way to say they can impact uh quail populations but not at a not at a high level you know if you got a place that's just flat eat up with um fire ants yeah, they may can do a little bit of damage to them, but but there again, you're only talking a small percentage of of birds that get impacted by them. And you know, it, my my predecessor likes to point out, you know, Virginia has the same decline that we had, and they didn't get fire ants until the mid 2000s. You know, oh five, oh seven, somewhere around there. You know, so. And, and and to that effect, Texas and Florida's had fire ants forever. You know, they still got quail. So it's just it's just one of those things that was just happenstance that we got them and the birds just happened to be disappearing. So, so long story short, they can impact the nest. It's not a not a huge impact population wise. Gotcha. Good. So, uh, what other programs? I know South Carolina. You you're the small game program coordinator what yep. other kind of programs does dnr what are they may have coming down the pipe or they're already got in place this they can people can get involved in to kind of help all of it in general the small game yeah um we are i'm just let's see we're talking about adding another focal area or so if we can figure out a couple partnerships um we are actually believe it or not, going to try to work with maybe the uh, National Park Service up there at Kings Mountain National Military Park. Um, they sort of contacted us and and asked us if we were interested. And we said, sure, we might could do some habitat work up there. And, and we started working with them several years ago, and it's just developed from there. And we're looking to partner up with Quail Forever, maybe put a biologist position up there, maybe put a full-fledged focal area up there and just spread us out a little bit and you know one thing that comes with those focal areas across the state is, is usually a, a farm bill biologist and what that guy does or that guy or girl i should say um they they interact with the public they're out there their sole purpose is to to go out to your farm for example have you meet one day look at the property give you some ideas how to manage and, and yeah usually we're sort of focused on bob white but they can write a management plan for anything, you know. Um, and, and so they give you the wildlife perspective of, hey, this is what you can do to improve wildlife on your habitat. And, you know, like I said, we've got currently got four of them across the state. So we got four farm bill biologists and then two other or three other additional small game staff that, that do these site visits. So if, you know, if y'all got landowners that are listening and want a site visit, give us a shout, contact us. We'll come out, look at your property, give you some ideas. Um, 
Another thing they help do is, is find that federal cost share money that's available for managing for these species. So there's a fair amount of, of federal cost share um, through the Farm Bill for bobwhites, for pollinators, and for longleaf pines. And a lot of folks don't know that money's sitting out there. They're already doing things, you know, for wildlife on their property, and they could be getting a cost share for it. They just don't know that that money's out there. So, And if they happen to live in one of the focal area counties, they get a couple extra points and, and may, may get the money a little bit easier. But as you can imagine, dealing with the federal government, there's, there's lots of red tape, and some of that paperwork can be pretty intimidating. So these farm bill biologists, they help, they help folks navigate that. You know, when they do it every day, it just makes sense to them. Um, it does not make sense to me, but it makes sense to them, and and they can they can walk a landowner through that, and that's you know sort of what they're there for. So, you know, we've got that going on. We're looking to add another focal area, hopefully. Um, we're either like I said, we're either going to do it up at Kings Mountain National Military Park, or maybe maybe down um, near the Francis Marion, or even maybe over near Edgefield McCormick area. Is is the three areas we're looking at? Um, you know, when, and when we had one of these folk areas, it's mostly about manpower. You know, a lot of folks will say, well, why isn't my county in the folk area? And I was like, well, you know, when we started in 2015, this was a one man shop and I couldn't do all the, <laughs> you know, all the state. So we, we've just sort of have to slowly grow. But so, like I say, we're hoping to maybe add that. And, um, you know, as, as far as other projects going on with a small game, we're, we're trying to, create a good bit more grouse habitat um if you exchange this whole conversation we've had exchange bob white and grouse we could do the same show for grouse you know they're 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 a high elevation quail basically um their population's impacted much like bob white's habitat they were they used a little bit older early successional habitat but it's still, they need disturbance and we just don't have disturbance in our mountains like we used to. Um, you know, it used to be a bunch of farming. It used to be a bunch of edge. It used to be some apple orchards, small farms, wildfires, all that in the mountains. And we just don't see it today. So we've got single age, old growth canopy and it's just not conducive for grass. So we're trying to do something similar to that. And, um, we're actually from the Woodcock front. We're working on a, um, cooperative project with the university of maine and most everybody on the eastern seaboard every state uh, we're putting radio transmitters on some woodcock and following them around and and right now they're starting for the fall migration and they're starting up in canada and rhode island and all and they're putting these transmitters on and watching the birds come down um we'll put some transmitters on probably about february is when we've been doing it and we watch them go back up and see where they spend the summers and all that. And, you know, it wasn't until technology got to be where you can put GPS transmitters on a little tiny, you know, six ounce bird, you know, that we, they were able to see some of the stuff and some of the stuff that's coming back from that project is just unbelievable. I mean, for the listeners that's never seen a woodcock, they're, they, they're like a bumblebee. They, they shouldn't be able to fly, but they can. <laughs> you know, they fly with a big old head and long bill sort of sticking straight up in the air. They got short stubby wings. You flush one in the woods, they go about a hundred yards and you think, man, how does that thing ever make it back and forth to Canada? But, you know, they're making a 500 mile trip overnight. They're flying over the ocean, going to Nova Scotia. They're crossing the Great Lakes. I mean, it's just amazing what they're doing. <laughs> and you know, you, we never knew until we started putting the GPSs on them. So that's the other thing. And then we're always working on more than dove habitat. Um, you know, we, we do a lot of uh, planting for for doves and do a lot of surveying on doves. Like I said, there's a little bit of interest at the federal level about dove populations. So, you know, we didn't do it this year, but most years we ask folks to volunteer to, to cut wings and, and send in to us. So we can get a pretty decent idea of what's going on with our dub population, but with COVID and all that, we didn't we didn't mess with that. Hopefully, we'll get back to that next year. So, Good. but that's sort of the small game program, okay. you well, know, operation for the next year. Or so, 
Well, as far as people, the public can go, what are some other groups besides the South Carolina Bob by Quail Initiative? What other groups can they get involved in? Or is there some online seminars? I, I think I've seen those one with uh, Clemson Extension Service that I think you had actually made. Can you tell us if yep. there's some stuff like that that people can use to get involved with? Yeah, sure. So um, one aspect of the Bob White Initiative is we have landowner field days across the state throughout the throughout the year, and, and we've partnered up with Clemson Extension. And um, like I say, they've got some really unique properties set up nicely for, you know, the teaching aspect. So we partnered up with them, and, and like you said, you can either do those in person, you know, assuming that we're not dealing with COVID anymore, or there's a couple of versions that we did online that we had taped and just put online because we, we couldn't get out and about. But um, so, yeah, you can you can you can get with your local Clemson Extension agent. Um, let's see. As far as some nonprofits go, you know, Quail, Ever, Quail Forever is trying to make a big impact here in South Carolina. And that's one thing that, that Quail needs. They need an advocate, you know, sort of like Ducks Unlimited has got. Um, you know, for years and years, we had Quail Unlimited. Um, they folded in 05, I think it was, and Quail Forever has been moving in. Um, I want to say it was 2015 or 2016, they put their first biologist in the state there at the Indian Creek uh, focal area in Newberry, and they've been growing ever since. Um, we've actually got two Quail focal area. I mean, Quail, two quail forever biologists here in the state and they're they're sort of our farm bill biologists in two of the focal areas we're looking to partner with them for a third they've got chapters across the state there's there's three or four chapters um i think there's a chapter that's actually going to be getting going here in greenville shortly a uh, group of young guys are, are getting together um you know they 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 started a group called the bird dogger social club and and prior to COVID, they were getting together and just talking birds and bird dogs and all that. And then they started doing everything virtually. So if you're on Facebook, you can find them. And like I said, they do a, a good bit of work and they wanted to get more involved. So they contacted Quail Forever. And, and I think they're going to start a chapter. Um, but like I said, Quail Forever is a fantastic organization. Turkey Federation, you know, we've partnered with them on a lot of stuff. And everybody goes, wait a minute, why are you partnering with Quail for? I mean, I mean Turkey the Turkey Federation, well, it's it's habitat, you know. They, it, it all comes back to that that one word, and you know, so they do a tremendous amount of work. Their their focus is is turkeys for sure, but they they create a good bit of quail habitat, and it works. Um, Backcountry hunters and anglers, they're fairly new here in South Carolina. They're looking at a lot of the same stuff that you know these other groups are looking at. You know, hunter access. Um, and habitat. So, you know, most any of the NGOs that you can find in South Carolina, we've partnered with, and, and and a lot of them are on the Quail Council. I mean, like I said, there was 35 or 40 different agencies and NGOs that are signed on that memora memorandum of agreement, you know, that created the Quail Council, and most of those NGOs are on there. So, um, you know, they're all fantastic organizations. Yeah, I'm a member of BHA myself, and I was glad to say we finally got our own chapter here in South Carolina. I was very excited to see that. I really was. I thought that was very cool. Yeah. Well, how can um, if people do have questions for you or the Quail Initiative, uh, how can they to tell us how we can they can reach you, where they can find you, where they can find more information, or you know, like I said, the seminars, things like that. Um. So you can find us on Facebook. If you look for SC Bob White, um, you can go to scbobwhite.org for the webpage. Um, you can email us at scbobwhite at dnr.sc.gov. Um, so you got a lot of options dealing with SC Bob White. <laughs> um, if, and if you Google my name, Michael Hook, and SCDNR, you know, my contact information will come up too, uh, my email and, and phone number and all. Um, but, yeah, just give us a shout. We'll we'll answer any questions we can. We can do, like I say, landowner site visits and, 
and all that good stuff. So, but yeah, I'm always up to talk birds and bird dogs and, and quail habitat. So. All right. Well, Mike, I really appreciate the time. I really do to talk about this. Uh, like I said, it was just nice this year to hear them for the first time in years and to hear as many as I did. And I, like you said, I think it was because of the habitat. We've kind of let things grow up a little bit and it's kind of made them some better habitat. Now we're going to take care of it. So I'll make sure as we're going to kind of leave some areas wild for them to kind of, and the rabbits too. I love seeing the rabbits and things like that. So we'll kind of designate a little areas here on the property where they can have a little bit of their own space. But man, thank you very much for this. Oh, you're quite welcome. And that's all it takes, honestly. Like they just leave in a corner here or there, get up woolly and overgrown. And that's it. That's all it needs. So I wish you luck with your birds and your rabbits and give me a shout back anytime. But uh, <laughs> thank you again, man. I really appreciate it. And I uh, hope everybody got some good information from you and they can contact you with any more. So I really appreciate the interview. Yeah, man. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Again, I'd like to thank Mike for coming on to the show today. And I hope you guys really learned a lot about quail, uh, their habitat, predators, things you can do to bring the quail back here to South Carolina, get the numbers back up so we can all hear that sound that most of us remember from when we were young or back in the 80s. And if deer season is going to be here in the upstate, rifle season starts on the 11th, which I think will be, which by the time you hear this, it'll have been yesterday. So hopefully everybody's deer season's going well. Continue to go well for everyone. I hope you enjoyed today's show. Come back next week. We'll have a new show ready for you. Please, uh, if you want to get a hold of me, reach out to my email is bottomdollaroutdoors at gmail.com. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash bottomdollaroutdoors. Twitter, the handle there is catfishbrad864. Instagram is Instagram. The handle there is bottomdollaroutdoorspodcast. Y'all have a Great, great week, and we will see you again next Monday with a brand new show. Not sure if it's going to be a live show on YouTube yet, but I'll have your show ready for Monday morning. God bless each and every one of y'all, and God bless the USA. Mm-hmm.